Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Tony Dudzik, Pick Guardian. Jared Brandon, Brandon Wound Pickups. Mike Trombley, Native Audio. Hello, Mike. Hey, hey. Mikey. Mikey's All back. Right. Oh, Band's back together. That is right. <laughs> and this is Todd Novak. We're super thrilled that you are listening to our show, The Guitar Knobs Podcast. And Mike, as the uh, you yes. know, semi-visiting guest type person, what, what do we do on this show here, buddy? Ah, uh, we just talk about gear, something, something stuff. What is it? What are we? We're the champion of the boutique builders. Oh, we're the champion of a <laughs> boutique builders. Thank you. Oh man, how did you? That just flowed wow. right off your tongue there. Yeah, yeah no. you know. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we interview boutique builders of guitars, amps, pedals and other type of gear. We also talk to influencers in the industry, people who are making it move and shake. We, we have learning episodes. We have learning episodes, the 101s. Those are quite popular. That's right. Uh, we have one of these people on the line today. Who can guess what it is? I don't know, but he's going to tell us. Tell us who you are, buddy. Uh, hi, my name is Rand Anderson, and I'm with Mutron. Mutron pedals. I love Mutron. Yeah, Jared is like. <laughs> uh, I'm like, not a Mutron expert, but I do love Mutron. <laughs> He's got a lot of Mutron. I do. And we're going to call it Mutron the whole episode. Mutron. That's going to be difficult <laughs> for me, but I'm going to do it. Me. <laughs> um, Rand was kind enough. Yeah. We, we, had a, we had a great call this, uh, this past week, and uh, he seems like a, a super awesome chap. Uh, we met him actually at, at NAMM briefly, and we had a good time. So we said, we need to get you on the show. So let's do this. We're, uh, I'm super excited to hear the four on the floor for this guy, too. Um, and I need to say thank you to Rode Microphones oh, for supplying guys. our microphones that we are talking on right and now. The Rodecaster Pro. That's right. The Rodecaster nice. Pro. The, uh, the the big machine, the big colorful machine here that's doing our thing. I like that. Um, this is making everything happen. And we're, we're still getting, uh, we're still, you know, kind of, Getting uh, getting it warm, getting it massaged, making it one of our own. Um, our old uh, crazy j- jalopy rig is is <laughs> still here. It is not undone yet. In the, the event of an through. emergency, the power is on. I see the lights yes, shining. Yes, but we are really loving this new road. Uh, machine and uh, if you are interested at all in in getting into podcasting yourself or or even using it to record your band honestly i'm probably going to take this home and record the band oh no you're not oh yes i am oh no you're oh, not oh no you're not that's a misuse of company stuff yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's under the contract but um it's a it's an incredibly affordable uh, way to get into um, recording things. So thank you, you to Rode for providing yeah, that for you. You should because it would familiarize yourself with a little more. Yeah, it's super good. Uh, okay, but aside from that, I do have a couple of announcements. One one of them, which was which absolutely delighted me this week. I got a big package from uh, a big package of stuff. Let me clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> from, I don't think so. From Champion Lecky, our buddy Wooly at Champion Lecky. Wooly! Uh, he sent a whole hey! bunch of swag for everybody. So when we send out our Patreon stuff, you're going to get more Champion Lecky stuff. Excellent. I mean, but, his stuff is awesome, but if you met him in yes, person, we're going to have him back. So funny. Yeah, he's a great guy. Now, a long time ago, he so he does these amazing sketches and stuff and he puts them on the pedals and everything and we said hey man would you send us one of your scrap sketches he sent us like an entire packet like full of not just his sketches these are his actual drawings and concepts for all of his pedals oh, it even has oh, the drawings with with with, di- with what schematics what schematics Whoa, <laughs> keep Mikey away from those yeah. Yeah. Schematic for this a is, special layer man. this is huge that's like, pretty cool it's oh, it's cool man. okay so champion lucky stuff is really cool but like honestly like that made me feel like a million dollars because he's like here you guys can have this stuff and this is his own personal stuff wow. this is what he yeah. built his company on it's like behind the scenes man it's really amazing so I'm gonna try to fi- I gotta figure out what to do with this proper can we make a coloring book <laughs> that would we, we might be able to do that yeah we could copy each one i want to i want to work around. something out so so patrons can benefit from this too oh yeah um yeah. but anyways i wanted to share this letter because this will give you a clue if you if you're not familiar with wooly um he sent this letter and on the back it says super legit letter from a 
well-organized small business that was cro- all crossed out and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and it says at the top of the page, official champion Lecky headed paper from the offices of champion. Lecky. And, and this, this is on a, uh, a yellow and, yeah. and blue ruled, you yes. know, tear out kind of shit. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it looks like something from fear and loathing in Las Vegas. I'm <laughs> not gonna lie. It's just like, it's like on college staff or whatever. Yeah. Whatever yeah. You call it. So it says there's a spot and it says today's date, which he doesn't put anything at. And also address also missing the address. <laughs> it says, hi knobs. Sorry for sending this stuff so late. The champion lucky way of doing things involves waiting until people think I'm dead or they're totally (laughs) forgotten that I exist. (laughs) Then I spring up as if out of nowhere and everyone is all surprised and they totally forget about the fact that I've just been super slow. Surprise. (laughs) (laughs) He says tees, magnets, uh, hard sticks and stickers are for, for you guys. Uh, badges and woozy stickers are for throwing at people from your cars or, you know, whatever. Lots of love. Wooly doggone it. We like that guy so much. And thank you. Framing that letter. Oh yeah, for sure. And really grateful. Um, Wooly for, for sending that stuff. You guys look, He's got a new one out called the Woozy, which um, uh, Demos in the Dark has been doing a lot of work with. So I would highly recommend checking that pedal out. It's mighty cool. I just want to pull up two more things. In a recent episode, we mentioned how people are uh, that are listening to the show are are like branching out and building all kinds of stuff, and it's pretty amazing. So one of those things was uh, Tim Nowak. No relation, because well, it's not really the same name at all. But anyways, so he's been a, he's been a great supporter of us, and he said um, he, he tagged us and sent me. He says working on my first PCB. It took me over a month to design this build and this bad boy, and I finally did it. It's a combination uh, CMOS fuzz and overdrive, and it sounds amazing. Now to get it boxed up, a big thanks to the Guitar Knobs. Your interviews of builders who have started from nothing really inspired me to test my limits and see how far I can take this. Love the show. So that's pretty I, that's killer. Just, it's that's rad. Killer. He, he was like, you know what? Maybe I can do this. And look what he did it. The Check build, that out. The build nice. looks pretty solid too. I like the ribbon cable. I like that too. It's, it's, it's clean. And then uh, we also have another, you've probably heard us mention Zach J. Wright many, many times on the, at the end of the show as a, as a uh, supporter of the, of the show as a, as an executive, the executive producer, producer his name right on the thing. Yeah, that's right. He was basically had to step away from the Patreon for a little bit. He said, Todd, I will be back. My business partner and I cut out all our Patreon to save money to finish off our guitar building shop. We fully intend to be back and supporting under our company name, York Guitars. It is our dream to be a guest on the show, eventually talking about um, our Ohio made guitars and pedals. We love you guys on the show. That's pretty amazing. I Heck love yeah, that. Yeah, man. I'm looking that forward to that. That is pretty killer. <laughs> So it's um, be cool. Yeah. Anyways, so so well, that what was, was the guitar. That was really neat. What was the company name? York York, York. Guitars. So York be looking guitars, out for okay. York Guitars in the future, everybody. I'll be checking. They also out. make peppermint patties. They do York peppermint patties. <laughs> hey. All right. Uh, we're going to discuss what's going on in our music worlds this week in the guitar business. Jared's got his hand just raised super big. Yeah, I want to be picked. Ah, uh, so um, I talked about the JCM eight hundred a few episodes ago, and. It was the 50 water, and uh, the 50 water was uh, an older one. So it was like an early 80s, I think, mid-80s. And I took that back to my buddy in Fremont, and I t- to me it just didn't have enough like bass going on. I don't know. It just wasn't dark enough for me. Um, so he said, well, why don't you take this 100-watt um, JCM 800 reissue? And I said, well, what's the difference between a reissue and an original? He said, not much with the circuitry, except for there's a uh, um, an effects loop on the back. And uh, he, he said there, you know, maybe there was a few improvements, but really no, no uh, big difference. So anyway, I bring it home, plug it in. And uh, I think I think the wattage change really just, I think it just kind of changed overall how it sounded. Doing out the 100 watts? Yeah. Yeah. So I got the 100 water. Yeah. And thinking, you know, before I was like, I don't need no 100 watts, but I'm wrong. I was wrong. Like, I really like this 800. I just love it. Are you talking head or combo? Just the head. Just the uh, head. Yeah, just the head. And I've got it plugged through, uh, uh, you know, just a JCM 800 cab with, uh, you know, vintage 30s. So. Right, right. 
So it's, uh, you know, they sound much better getting pushed by 100 watts rather than the 50. So I'm going to probably stick with that amp. 100 water. Yeah, 100 water. It's a reissue. Okay. Good thing you got that off. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, you know, with the volume control, the gain in the the main, it's it's not bad, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not twice you, as loud. It's Right, just, if you really want to crank it up and get that, I don't know, because when you use the aux, you're not pushing the speaker cap, and you're not getting the effect of mm-hmm. getting the speaker cap pushed. Mm-hmm. So I'll just turn it up and just kind of go behind it. And the aux, for those who don't know what that is, just really briefly. It's a uh, real high-end, uh, call it a power attenuator. I mean, and, and the output power attenuator not okay. yeah not you can AC crank it. your amp up and not have it blaring out your speakers and you can kind of get the benefits of a you know turned up amp um however you know you know i think part of the whole experience having a, a high power amplifier is is the sound of those speakers being pushed yeah, yeah. interesting but, definitely you know the, another good thing about the ox is you there's a a speaker simulation so you can just not have a cab at all and uh, the reason I bought that is uh, for shows and whatnot. So people can listen to pickups and through amps that they respect uh, without bothering the, the other vendors around us. Oh, right. Nice. Let's hear from our buddy, Ran. What's going on in your music world? Uh, it was Recon. I dropped a bunch of speakers off at uh, right, right at NAMM, actually, the, the spots by there. So I just picked them all up. Awesome. So which, I'm ripping uh, apart which, cabinets and amps and and putting them all in and uh, switching stuff around. What what speaker shopper are you talking about? Uh, well, this is uh, Bow. He oh. he worked at Orange County. Yeah, I was going to say Orange County. I'm familiar with, but speaker or uh, now they're called Speaker Repair Pros. So he was kind of the guy doing everything there. Oh, cool. So he went over. He's got his own thing going. He's got a uh, one of three in existence uh, magnetizing machines. So wow. Uh, mm. at, and and knows probably more about some of the speakers than the manufacturers. So, In- I love interesting, those people, uh, man. I, I just love. Yeah, them. right. They, that's, yeah, that's super cool. So apparently, with with what he's telling me, there was no such thing ever as a JBL sixteen ohm, although they were marked that way that they weren't actually sixteen ohms. Were they, were they all fifteens or? No, they were all eights. Really? They were all eight, eight ohm speakers, but they just said 16 ohm for some odd reason. Fraud. Wow. So, yeah. Fake. Lawsuit. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's cool. I mean, if you actually ohm out a 16 ohm or an eight ohm, they're always a little under anyway. Yeah, well, so these are the, the one twenties, so they're the vintage ones. I can't, I, I don't know what about, you know, modern stuff for that. But. Uh, yeah. Huh. Interesting. Huh. Good to know info. I, Yes. I reckon so, but he, but he had a bunch of cool stuff for sale, Macintosh speakers and um, lots of different variants and that. Neato. Cool. It, well, you know, it's interesting to see what, what other kind of broken stuff people are fixing. As it, you know, <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> what, what's out in the marketplace and what might not be working, what, you know, these touring guys are using. and Yeah. Dig it, man. Very cool. Uh, Mike, what's going on in your music world? Uh, so I guess I'll come back with a report. You know, I, I know last time I was in here, I was talking about the DSL 20, the Marshall. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, good report. It sounds good now. That's Yay! Good. Yay! I know. And I'm actually running it through, uh, my two twelve uh, inch Jensen's of oh. my, the, of the twin reverb. So really? I'm, yeah. So I'm just hooking the speakers into that, uh, output there for the DSL 20. But I found that uh, I actually just run this thing on the uh, high gain channel. Um, And I pretty much keep gain at about like 11 o'clock and then I just mess with the volume. But I found that just by adjusting the volume on my guitar, I can go anywhere between like clean to high gain mm. just by the volume so i've been running it like that for probably the past month and a half that's, and that's like dude, it sounds really like old school style yeah exactly and it sounds so good and uh that also has the effects uh loop so that's been really uh good you know as far as like messing around with you know my pedals um doing a lot of you know just testing around with them yeah yeah Very cool. so so the dsl 20 is rocking nice yes. mighty fine tony Yes. What's well, I've got uh, I've got I've got three things, two of which are related. You only okay. get to say one. So yeah, about no, one. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with all three. 
because I can't. Uh, <laughs> first it. of all, I scored some really cool uh, Rogan uh, Brothers knobs. Uh, they're kind of they're inch about an inch and a half around, and they're black, and they've got like this uh, a, a silver pointer on them. So can we say that's cool? like the classic Rickenbacker style? Well, it's not exactly. A, that's that's how I stumbled onto these. Okay. They're not quite the Rickenbacker style. They're a little smaller, and they've got a silver point on them, but it's like a giant arrow. Yeah. And they're from probably the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and I got nine of them for like 50 bucks, which is, is a steal. Is that a steal. good deal? Well, they're usually about 10 bucks a piece. Ah. Oh. So uh, I'm, pr I'm pretty stoked about those because, uh, you know, I don't, I won't use them. Uh, I might use them on some projects, but I just, you know. You'll find it. You'll figure it out. They're just really cool looking. It's kind of Star Trek-y yeah. so yeah. looking. So you're not going to put them on a guitar or anything? Yeah, I will. You're going to put them in your I'm going to uh, put them on. Your, your I'm going to put them on a native audio pedal. Oh, oh yeah. That'd be perfect. <laughs> I'm on a chest of drawers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> chest of drawers. Yeah. Uh, and then the two things. So I, I was doing a lot of trolling on DHgate, and we've talked about this in the past. I've, I've picked up a couple of things on there. It's kind of the Chinese... Uh, Amazon, I guess you would say. And, um, <laughs> they've got, uh, some really incredibly inexpensive guitars. Um, I think last we talked, I it was, is shocking. It's, yeah. it's just downright shocking. And it's, uh, it, I think we were talking in the past about, uh, some of the, the clear Ampeg style, um, uh, right. Plexi Dan guitars, Dan Armstrong, Dan Armstrong. Yeah. And, uh, so I ended up getting one of those. I've, been very happy with it, had it set up, but I, I, I'm a Rickenbacker fan, as many of you know, and, and I found um, uh, what, and it, once you are on there a while, you kind of figure out the nomenclature, because they can't really say Rickenbacker, right. uh, but they've got... Um, Schmickenschmacker? <laughs> but, they, but they've got uh, all kinds of things. So this was some, some cherry burst jazz guitar and you know if you look at the photos it's like a rickenbacker uh 360f which is kind of an unusual guitar that rickenbacker made in the 50s and 60s and um and it was uh it's basically like a gretch shape a single cut gretch but it has a flat top and bottom so they had one of these and of course i saw it I had to buy oh, it. Boy. <laughs> oh gosh! And it was like um, eighty nine dollars. No, or it was a little more than that. <laughs> but shipped from China was like just a just a hair over three hundred dollars. Very cool. What? What, what's uh, what's the color on it? It's a cherry burster, you fire glow, whatever okay. you want to call it. T you know, typical, sure, sure. typical uh, Rickenbacker thing. And then I was looking for the the proper tailpiece, which is you know it, we've talked about. I, I got some a twelve string tailpiece from Winfield, but it turns out there was a guy in Argentina <laughs> that has uh, really uh, really good prices on the, essentially the same types of things, and it. One step better, it turns out he is actually a customer of mine who has bought uh, a guard or two over the years. So it worked out really well. I, I ended cool. up, I got the a really cool, it's it's called a long tailpiece, trapeze tailpiece. And we worked out a really good deal. And uh, so by you the got time- got all the things. I got the stuff. The stuff is coming. Nice, man. Mm. Another busy week at Pit Guardian. Very good. Wheeling and dealing. Projects. Right. How about you, Projects. Todd? Uh, you know, uh, I had most of my week, we had a gig last Saturday for Record Store Day. Um, mm. That's dating this probably a little bit. So, oh, you know, yeah. but uh, that's Ooh. cool. Um, and that was really fun. Um, and can I, uh, let's see, I had... Uh, my nephew, my my cousin. I feel like he's my nephew because he's so young, but he's actually my cousin. Um, he said, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna be looking for a, a new guitar," and uh, so he started asking me about it. He said, "I went to Guitar Center, and I said, what's a good starter guitar?" And they they handed him a four hundred dollar uh, Epiphone Les Paul. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> Let's talk about this. So that's really fun. I love shopping for other people like guitar stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and so it was really cool. I'm like, there's loads of options, but I'm just curious. Okay. One word, in, like quick lightning round. All right. I want to go around the table. All right. If you were asked that question, what would be your recommendation for a great starter guitar that, uh, you know, maybe sub, let's say sub $400. Okay. Uh, go around the room, starting with Mike. Uh, I would go with like a Mexican strat. Oh, you just took mine. Oh, did I? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a solid. I, I mean, I was in the same situation. Uh, I think last year, my, uh, 
my friend, uh, his wife was trying to find a guitar for him and she was like, ah, 400, $500 price range. And so I pulled up a Mexican Strat and brand new or Craigslist, uh, brand new. Ooh. And, uh, yeah, I mean, but they're out in Montana, so they don't have too many options. With yeah, Craigslist. I guess so. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, he fell in love with it. That's cool. Mm. Rand, how about you? I was going to say Mexican tally just cause I, I think, you know, Harder to keep in tune with that floating bridge. Yeah, so. the telly is a good choice. And also the uh, pickup selector is easy enough, too. Yep, that's yeah, true. Tony? Well, I, I mean, on the upper end of the Epiphone line, I think those are all pretty good. But I think for, for a good solid starter guitar, I'd go with one of the GNL Tributes, the Tribute series. Um, they're basically overseas-made guitars, but they put uh, American electronics in them. Mm -hmm. uh, the pickups are all USA. So mm -hmm. uh, every one that I've ever tr uh, tried or worked on, I found that the, the Tribute series is solid. Yeah. Excellent. They can do that, too, because I've seen their winder at the, the shop there. I took the tour. Fantastic place, by the way. Their winder does like six bobbins at a time. Jeez. Wow. It's crazy. Wow. It's kind of like Brandon one. That's crazy. Mm. Jared, what are you choosing? <laughs> Uh, I got to go back to the, uh, the Mexican, uh, Fender series because I, I own one mm -hmm. and I love the neck of that guitar. I could just play the thing all day. I, I changed out the electronics and stuff and, uh, you know, I got how I want, but mm -hmm. the neck on this guitar, I I wouldn't trade it for anything else. Interesting. So I'm going to pull a wild card and I would say I would go, uh, my, my knee jerk reaction is going to say Mexican telly all the way. However, because of the amazing deals that I keep con continuously seeing on Eastwood guitars, mm. I would, I would see about something on there cause you can get a pretty dang fun guitar. That's going to be well built and you, and they've got sale prices under sub 400 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. And that is shipped and I believe I I could be wrong but I believe they're shipped with case. I'm not positive on that. Mm, I don't think so. But <laughs> anyways, they're running deals like crazy all the time. Um and so uh, that's just a that's just a wild card option. Or right? you go to DH yeah. gate like I or, do. Or <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't no, do that. No, don't no, no, you that. gotta be semi experienced. But I'm just it, waiting it, for Tony to get his guitar and it's gonna be the size of a ukulele. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, all that said, what we were talking about that's Every good. one of those guitars that we mentioned, you can find on Reverb, super cheap. Oh, yeah. Yep. You can find on Craigslist, Definitely. super cheap. Yep. Go Walking right into like Guitar Center to buy a guitar. I, I mean, I'm not going to say don't do it, but um, there's lots of other options. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Used is always better than new. Yeah, it's already broken in and stuff. Or broken. Yeah, or broken. <laughs> anyway, so I just thought that was a kind of a neat thing. Um, so we're still working that out. Now, I want to hear something from Rand. One, two, one, two, three, four on the floor. All right. We've been waiting for this one. Rand, the purveyor of Mutron pedals. What is your four on the floor? Well, my, my four on the floor, I think, is uh, it comes down to maybe four effect classifications that I, I think uh, I can't live without. You know, you have um, maybe some sort of, um, you know, I think everybody has their favorite overdrive or distortion pedal. Would go with my uh, good old fashioned TS9. Tube Screamer. Yes. What a, what a classic. Hey. Yeah, was, I have that one on my board, man. Technically, it's an ST9, a super tube, and uh -huh. that's uh, got four knobs on it. They were a little rarer, so a lot of them got circulated out in Europe in the. Um, I've got I've got two of the nines, and one came from a uh, effects uh, shop in Amsterdam back in the nineties. Oh wow! And then I have two of the ten versions of that, or maybe three that I bought as backups. And this is the super. That, the super. The TS? It's called a Super Tube, an okay. ST9 or a TS9 in the 10 series. So they had the old JRC4558 thing going on, but. Uh, you know, where a nine feels more just like in that overdive range, I felt with that, the yes, the super tube with that extra knob, you could kind of get m more uh, more crunch out of it. And right. Possibilities, less of that mid range hump, and you had, had more Very tunability cool. with it. So, <laughs> so that that's pretty much like the spot there for that pedal. Um, and I always think, you know, 
I love phasers. So, of course, I always had uh, my favorite was always the, the Mutron stuff. I can't, you know, old stuff. I really didn't have much to do with that. Of course, I was like three when they were making those things. So, right. <laughs> um, so I, I have a, a few of those that I got in, in pawn shops and wherever over the years. Um, Which, back back in the back in the days when I had, you know, everybody had a six way strip on their pedal board, right, with the uh, wall warts and stuff everywhere. So uh, which uh, now that's the fa- that's which phaser is that? I would, uh, phaser two was uh, the the basically the way it went at Mutron. They had the phaser one was the first one that came out early, and that was an OTA based operational transconducted sample fire. I see. Um, which which a lot of people loved, sounded great, but it was too hard to make. And in the process, basically, they went and made. They had a lot of R and D things that never saw the light of day. But one, one, the they moved from that OTA to an optical design, and they actually built the biphase before they built the phaser two. Interesting. Huh. Well, we're going to so, get deep into the history and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't mean to sidetrack, but anyhow, so the phaser two was kind of the lesser model that came after the biphase, and it was just a nice optical one and. Back back in whatever the nineties, it, it still seems reasonably sized for a pedal board. Yeah, well, uh, it's a gorgeous pretty, pedal because it's so odd. It doesn't look like every other pedal. Yeah, so uh, you know, I, and the other alternatives I always had, you know, MXR nineties or one hundreds. Yeah, the, the one hundred was a six stage uh, optical, but it never sounded as good to me as like uh, with distortions and rat pedals and. Right or whatever to Marshall amps, I, you you wanted that kind of deal, and of course I love the Boss ones too, the early PH twos, the green ones. Nice. So number three, I think you got to have like I I love octave pedals, always have. So um, I have an old, just beat up, can't even tell Octavia, Tycho Brahe original deal. That's a good one. Um, mm. That thing's pretty wicked. So that, that's a must have. And that's the coolest name uh, ever. Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe. I don't even know if I say it right. I you know, know you are saying it right. <laughs> is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Like, Tycho Brahe. <laughs> <laughs> that's after a night of heavy drinking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, some sort of delay pedal. So I, I, I think I really grew pretty fond of tape delays at one point. This is your number four? Yeah, I'd say okay. it's my number four. Does, can a tape delay be that four on the you floor? Can I put it on the floor? <laughs> yeah. All right. So I really like the Ibanez uh, Echo Machine. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Five, I think, five series plastic thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, they did a pretty good job. It's kind of low grade, so lo-fi. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for sharing your four on the floor. That is one of our listeners' favorite parts of the show. That's as right. It is mine. And uh, we're going to have that out there on the internet for everybody. You can go to the guitarnobs.com to see the full rundown and click on those pedals and go get one if you want it. We've got Rand Anderson from Mutron Pedals. Now, he kind of he, he mentioned something earlier is like this isn't the the gentleman who invented the mutron pedals but he is the current meister of the pedals yes it's uh that's what uh pretty much that what going on I'm, <laughs> <laughs> so some, this is like janitor or something you know uh, yeah. so, but uh yeah I, I you know i've been luck i don't know how we we joke about it mike beagle and i how our fates have intertwined and uh, but uh basically was able to uh end up working t- together for the last six or seven years at mu effects and uh kind of just transferred over and got the Mutron back up and running. And it, it also includes uh, Mike is, is working on the design end as well as um, Richard from L sound, who's probably the foremost repair Mutron expert in the United States, if not the world. Oh, wow. And he, he worked closely with Mike to uh, develop a lot of the electro harmonic stuff when, when Mike was making, uh-huh. you know, he was designing effects for lots of folks. Yeah. And, and I've also 
had the privilege of also reconnecting with both the CEO of the original Musitronics, uh, Aaron Newman, as well as... So that's uh, what Henry it actually Z- stands for, Musitronics. Musitronics Corporation. Okay. Yep. Yes. And uh, as well as Henry uh, Sajak, who was kind of, I would say, he ran the production um, for Mutron, as well as other companies down the line. They all came from Guild. Okay. Uh, Interesting. So M- M- Musitronics was born out of Guild. I didn't huh. know that. Ah, yeah. okay. You never would have thought yeah. that. I never would have thought that. Well, they they had a uh, a synthesizer division was starting to pop up, and the guy that was championing it, I believe, uh, ended up in a plane crash. Yeah, or something. Al- oh. Alfred, something. Alfred Drong, 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 Al or, Drong. Or something, something, and he was going to do it, and then he went away. It was his project, maybe, and and so they wanted to go on with this technology, and uh, uh, Aaron got the money together, and they got the company, and they went down the road. They had the R and D up in New York and the t- production down in New Jersey. Huh. Interesting. And and it was born. It was born in seventy two and, and I think then, you know, it was this crazy frontier to, you know, digital was just barely on the horizon and just what was going on on the airwaves and in New York City in terms of sessions and players and, and all that. Well, it was a special time. So what was what was the first Utron pedal? It was it was the uh, envelope filter. Uh, well, the fa- the phaser one and the envelope filters were the first things that came out. Stevie Wonder was the first endorsed artist in 1972. Holy smokes! Yeah, and he used it on a clavinet in the higher ground. So yeah. that became kind of a staple sound in funk. Was a uh, you know the clav clap filter huh. deal like all sorts of funks bands um i i tried to put together i was teaching music uh for a while at his school and then i was putting together for the kids just like almost a a, a listening list on funk clav walk because it was amazing that all the music that came out in a short span of time with that as a result of that probably uh, yeah as a result of that i mean it, it could be now they have like you know music major disciplines and in, in banjo and folklore music and that but it's like right. a clav walk could definitely be a a, a a major or something there there's some youtube you should check out there's the guy playing a whammy on a clav too right and he's got the funk clav with the whammy bar on it just amazing <laughs> wow he's uh, like the hendrix of clavinet i think he's out of <laughs> australia that's crazy let me see. We have so many questions to ask you. This is crazy. Um, well, let, let's just keep on the history train with yeah, the, the Mutron because I, I think the 72, so, you know, and move on. And I'm always finding out interesting stuff from people. Like, I didn't know Ace Freely from Kiss played Mutron stuff. He, but some fan sent in a thing here. He's, he's playing this solo from Shock Me in Houston, 1976, 77 or something live. Wow. Huh. And he's fully, he's got the octave divider on and the Les Paul and the fire coming out of it. <laughs> well, of course. Uh-huh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Was there a special Mutron that had fire coming out of it? Too? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it was, but somebody just bought a, um, something off a of reverb. They contacted us. It was a Mutron three that they used by uh, the techie certified it all from, uh, the grateful Dead. it was one of Jerry's that they pulled all the parts out to keep his, number one and two units alive wow wow that's cool but i never saw the ending price on it so i was curious but he he wanted to get it working and repaired in working order so anyhow so like uh, you know that uh, zappa was a big mutron guy he used uh he had a green ringer so mutron actually many you know I, they had big nasa high-end kind of stuff it's like you know having universal audio stuff on your pedal board back then it was pretty spendy so they had a hard time selling, I think, as many units as they could. So they got into making products for other people and trying to get it into entry level stuff. So the Dan Armstrong, um, was well, somebody mentioned the Armstrong guitars, the yeah, loose side guitars, yeah. right? So that guy also was designing circuits and making these little uh, modules that would just plug into your guitar. Yep. And then you run your, your cordage or you could reverse the wiring and put it in, into your amp. If you didn't want it hanging out of your guitar, huh. yep. So I actually I I'd, I'd like kind of really loved the Orange Squeezer for many years out of that series, um, 
uh, JFED best uh, compressor. What, what was that, the what was the overdrive that he did? The blue was it the blue uh, shoot a blue clipper blue clipper blue clipper yeah yeah so it was kind of a fuzz I wouldn't I would say it's super fuzzy yeah um but the Zappa had the green ringer which when I meant I mentioned the Octavia earlier the green ringer was sort of Musitronic's take on that or Dan Armstrong's take rather um, he had them originally manufactured by some company in England and then brought them over. And they worked out a deal, and then the Musitronics logo went on them, or the Mutron logo went on them. So, so, so Rand, um, at this point in time, would you say that like Mutron was trying to uh, like tend towards guitarists or tend towards other like music uh, electronics? <laughs> Well, it was kind of evolving. I think, you know, the effects industry, everybody kind of got into it. It got super maybe saturated might be a word. Yeah. And at the same time, digital was on the horizon. You yeah. know, you're approaching the 80s synthesis, all the MIDI, all the synthesis, right? Right before all this crazy new wave music hit that was going to use all that. I mean, yeah. that's where everything was going. And I don't think they anticipate, they didn't, you know, they didn't know then that people would, 25 years later go oh my god that's the best phaser ever they're like oh we're not selling phasers we better make something else yeah because it sounds like the uh you know like with um stevie wonder and you know a couple of these other guys that weren't uh your typical guitarist it sounds like they were kind of expanding the effects area i guess you would say yeah yeah, but right. if you look at the actual effects that uh, Musitronics were based making, even for guitar and, and other people at that time, I think is almost like the ADSR kind of synthesis, synthesis LFO. You yeah. know, they were taking, they were sub, you know, taking, decomposing a synthesizer and put modularizing it into pedals in a way. So um, I think when you put those the Mutron pedals together in series, you end up with pretty a monophonic synthesizer sort of vibe. Yeah. Early Kansas really reminds me a lot of, you know, this crazy synthesized sound. And I don't know if they use Moog or Mutron or whatever, but. Well, there was, there was a lot, you know, I, of, I, that was kind of the state of the art in terms of maybe the, what they knew in, in uh, maybe academic circles and the research and development had yeah. kind of, so synthesis became the thing and what happened is is mutron like in about the 70 late 70s there was a band 10 cc mm -hmm. they had a, a song um the, thing, the things we do for is, love the things we do for love right and and they, somewhere on that record they used this instrument they basically uh, fetched up the uh, resonance kind of synthesis deal and it became known as the gizmatron and the the guys from that band they had a hit with it and they were able to pitch this to musitronics and so musitronics basically outvoted effects to synthesizers i i don't know what the board was at the time you know it was seven to five or something a split vote and they went with the producing the gizmatron and the Gizmatron pretty much bankrupted them. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it didn't work, and it wasn't what they thought it was going to be, and the whole market shifted. They'd come out with their first rack mount digital delay, but it was all actually manufactured by ARP, ARP synthesizers, and had bought Musitronics to kind of get them out of debt. That was debt. like and, uh, late 70s, right? Yeah, yeah was, you okay. know, right around 80, and yeah. so they bought... Bought the company and then uh, they went out of business. Oh god! So the guys never even got their their parachute. And uh, oh. Aaron had a heart attack. He was forty nine. He oh. got out of the music business forever. Went into other things. I got I got to meet a friend of his kid at Nam this year, and uh, he I got to talk to Aaron on his eighty eighth birthday. So. That's he wow. told me all these all these crazy war stories, and <laughs> they thought the Gizmatron was a hit. They were high fiving everybody on the plane back from Nam, and you know <laughs> that thing's amazing. Oh my gosh! And so then, uh, uh, so then that was the prototype that worked. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> so then, so, following uh, following them being sold, did so Mutron just went silent until so yeah, Arp went silent, Mutron went silent. Yeah. Um, 
a couple of the guys kind of went their own directions. Uh, Mike, in particular, he he went and did the uh, his started Beagle Sound Labs, and he tried to make a rack mount filter, which he made fifty of them, mm-hmm. um, which were actually probably the best envelope control filter you'll ever get, but they're pretty rare. What was that? What um, was that? It, it was called the ECF, the Envelope Conf- Control Filter by Beagle Sound Lab. Okay. So only only 50 of those. And then he wow. kind of started get contracting and building um, effects for other folks. But he had, designed, he had designed that in conjunction with a guy named Elliot Randall. And Elliot was the guitar player from the Saturday Night Live band all through like the 70s, Gilda Radner and Chevy oh, wow. Chase and, yeah. and that. And he also played for Stevie Wonder and he also played for Steely Dan. He, he uh, Maybe his solos, Hey 19 or Ricky Don't Lose, one of those is him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's just this really cool guy. They were like best friends. And so Elliot had a big hand to do with development, you know, as the, as a musician with Mike as kind of the engineer, they co-designed that, that uh, ECF filter as well as, uh, you know, getting into some other stuff. And then Mike went and did a lot of, a lot of the designs for electro harmonics in the nineties and then ended up doing RFID tag researches on penguins for down in antarctica well that's the next logical step. <laughs> yeah. yes yeah <laughs> envelope filters <laughs> to penguins <laughs> that's actually well, pretty cool yeah. man that is cool well if you have to well, deal with musicians this killer rack and there's only 50 of them and nobody wants them you know yeah. so what else is there to build you know that's crazy mutron sets up a big presence makes a lot of pedals and then kind of goes silent now Anybody that's been pot, bit, buying pedals as of late at the guitar shows or at Reverb, uh, we all tend to want what is either too expensive or that there are too few of. Those old Mutron pedals fall into both of those categories and off, often. There has been such a resurgence in the old Mutron pedals that, that we're talking about. I, I'm just curious, being at Mutron, how, what do you make of all this? Like, how is this affecting you? And where do you think that this just resurgence of love for that, that brand is coming from? Well, it's the reason I'm involved with this. I mean, um, I was using this stuff in my boards back in the nineties and, uh, it, it hadn't hit as much of a resurgence in the vintage market wasn't even there then. I sold my clon for like 300 bucks, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I had the Mutron and I always said, well, gosh, I'm tired of running. There wasn't voodoo labs, bricks on your boards. You, there was this just dark ages. Everybody had gone from racks in LA to, you know, from hair metal bands and, Mesa boogie preamps and these huge monstrous racks with ADA MP ones and stuff to back to pedal boards. So back to blackface amps and simple Marshall tubes. And we're going to just run some pedal board pedal, a couple pedals in front of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you had two or three and you you need to have your six way strip so you could plug in your Mutrons, you right. know, you had your, the phaser and they all had wall warts coming off the octave divider, the, even the Mutron three. And I was just like, gosh, this is rough. Why can't this be shrunk down? Why can't, uh, the routing was even running from left is, was the input and amplifier was on the right. Really? So, you know, you, you, yeah, you, on a lot of electro harmonics and stuff. So you end up getting hogtied on stage and you, you, there weren't even you couldn't buy a pack of patch cables from anybody and you couldn't make your own because none of that existed. So you just have this crazy rat's nest in <laughs> front of you. And we, you know, we build these boards at, at Home Depot parts and put them in Tupperware and stack them in the van and that would be OK. But then, you, you know, I, I started realizing we're, we were playing the band. I was we were playing in Colorado a lot. And on a cold night, the Mutron wouldn't work at all. Why is that? So oh. I. I it's an optical deal. Oh. And I didn't know why then. And nobody really knew why then. But uh, after I started talking about this stuff with Mike, and see, Mike did a lot of this in the lab. So he didn't really know 
uh, f- from like a road standpoint, the problems I was seeing, mm. like you, you got to plug from right to left. Everybody stands and the fex chain goes that way nowadays and mm-hmm. nine volt and they're in the power bricks and you can't have it. It's got to be negative center. Or, so just little things that it made everything work harmoniously and then pedal supplies had come along and you know they were still building i think he designed the qtron was like a 24 volt dc input so that had its wall wart you mentioned wall wart a few times i think for the younger audience just describe what a wall transformer wart is. it's a hunkin transformer by four by three by two inches that plugs into the wall it has two prongs right and runs runs a super thin cable which likes to break right when when sound guys in their cowboy boots like grind their heels on your stuff <laughs> right so so basically what we're saying is that that each one of those um each one of those pedals essentially had um its own you know it's it's a standard big black square that plugs into the wall mm-hmm. right. so you would get what we call a six-way power strip you know that you see under like a computer desk and Right. Try to put turn wall warts in opposite directions so they would fit. You could fit more. And you had to get crafty. You had to get crafty. But, you know, the every given night you're tearing your pedal board apart, figuring out, is it a wall ward or is it a broken cable or is the effect itself gone? Because you didn't even have like true bypass and there wasn't any looper boxes. So, um, you know, it was quite a bit of capacitance and degradation going on. Right. And uh, that became part of your tone. You just dealt with it. (laughs) (laughs) So is there, as you're sitting, you you know, um, in the present state now is, I know that you are making new versions of the, of the Mutron pedals. I'm I'm curious to know before we get deep into that, like, I think we imagine maybe, or at least I do that you guys are sitting around there, you know, making your pedals are like, what the crap is everybody? Everybody's going crazy for these old pedals and they're spending huge amounts of money. Is that expected? Is that a shock? Is it, how do you, how do you face in that? Well, we joke, we always joke about it. I'm like, you know, we should just get out of designing pedals and just play the market and just set up a mutual fund and buy and sell <laughs> pedals and speculate. <laughs> uh, but I mean, we've, we've really seen it fluctuate. And I mean, we've, we've sold stuff one day at fair market value, knowing good, well, we're going to make more and sell them next week when we can get some more built. And people are, you know, sab or whatever, you know, scalping them the next day mm-hmm. and people buy them. And <laughs> I don't, we don't feel good about that. I mean, we say basically, you know, we don't want you to hoard these things. We want you, everybody to have one, but we, we are building everything here in the U S and they takes time. And we, we really are stringent on our quality control because these guys are looking at us as a higher end company and said, well, you've been in business since 1972. You guys must be mega. Right. You're like no, no, no. We went bankrupt in 1980, <laughs> and we just started back up in 2018. Technically, we relaunched right. as Mutron. Mike and I had Mu Effects since 2013, um, and we just we learned a lot about the industry then, and the industry sure changed in that time. In fact, I think it was at one of the NAMs, and I we had the Trutron filter. We couldn't give them away. Mm. nobody cared about that sound and then you, you know up. Jeez. <laughs> john john mayer goes out with the dead next year we got you know this line of people that want these things so yeah, right um yeah it's just luck and timing with that and but the uh, the other um you know so we developed a boostron there which i still think is one of the coolest pedals ever that's the one um, I have. I have one signed by Mike Beagle, actually. He, he, Jared found it out. He's been dying. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. So Mike and I designed that. And back when I had my ghetto pedal board, um, the first pedal in my chain was always a what was called a Stratoblaster. And that came out of Alembic, was a company in the Bay Area in the 70s that they made really high-end bases and stuff. Yeah, they those were actually... Right. Those are like $12,000 bases, right? Yeah, like and, and a really famous really blackface <laughs> preamps and stuff like yeah. that, a rack mount that like bass Stanley players Clark. love. And Boom. Stanley Boom. Clark. Oh, man, that guy's So, So the, the Straddle Blaster would go in your Strat Jack. You'd take out that. You'd wire this in with a battery, and it gave you a clean boost. 
uh, tran- transistor kind of based you know, or, or not not the straddle blaster, but um, I'm, I'm confused myself. But a different it's just a straight clean boost that um, a lot of guys, uh, Lowell George from Little Feet was using um, uh, Andy Summers from the police. So you have a black face fender amp, you put the strata blaster in front, but it really does a nice thing dr- driving your chain. This was before buffer boxes and things. Uh-huh. Cool. So um, that would go in and I would always have these old Mutrons and vintage pedals, e- uh, EH electro harmonics, you know, um, octave multiplexers, things like that. And they would be super hot. So I'd have to walk back to my amp and turn it down every time I turn one of these on. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, maybe put a volume pedal after it, oh, uh, there wasn't like which I like because you can kind of, kind of thing. yeah, yeah, and um, or a compressor, right? So I I wanted to build kind of my own compressor, so that was where we took that orange squeezer circuit. Um, I'd always had a compressor. I was using the Keeley for for a long time, and MXRs and old Ross pedals. Um. So that, and then the the third channel on that Boostron was a RAT, an LM three hundred um, eight. Wow, that that could also be set to just almost like an edgy, clean, bite kind of overdrive. Not even a overdrive, like a clean boost again. Uh, um, so that that pe- that pedal had the blaster, the the uh, effects loop, and then a compressor, and then squeezer, the, yeah. The squeezer was the the other, so it was a four in one kind of thing, and almost like a channel strip on your pedal board. Um, we forgot the EQ part, though. I think was the most important part. Ah, it, that's the switchable, right? You can make. Oh, uh, it's, it's yeah, it's it's like a hardwired filter, but we always wanted to redo it with the tone stack there instead. Oh, okay, okay, and then the. Um, the blaster. So I we we have redesigned a, a Boostron two, which will come out and be the successor. But that numbering, it's actually going backwards. That's going to have less features. Huh. I know that you're you're drawing on some of the old stuff for the new. Do you find that people are are they gravitating towards the new ones easily, considering the the high demand for the old pedals? Is there any kind of challenge there at all? You know, I don't, I honestly don't think so. I, at one point I was like, you know, we should do like a pre, pre certified pre-owned thing and buy, get, get these old ones back and get them factory snuff and maybe even manufacture them looking like the old ones. Huh. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, I don't want to really take my vintage stuff out on my boards. I like to build a pedal board. I can throw in a swimming pool and replace everything tomorrow. <laughs> um, or a drunk guy spills his beer on it or whatever. But That's what remember really what happens, I said about yeah. the, the cold weather, too. And what people don't realize, right? They, I, I turned on my SPX 90. Does anybody know what that is? I think so. Okay, so this is your, it's your nice outboard rack gear reverb for your snare sound in the 90s, 80s. Oh, oh yeah. I it was a Yamaha that. unit. So reverb unit, but I, I you know, pushed it on. I wanted to use it the other day. And smoke came out of it. <laughs> so I was like, oh, man. Always a I got stuff. a cap job. I got all this stuff. You got to keep it going. You got to keep yeah. on top of it. It's like a car. You don't give it an oil change, you know? And I, I think people forget that about this stuff's 40 years old, man. It's, it's not built to last forever. The other thing I learned about the older Mutron stuff is, you know, that the fault tolerances are not, not even the fault tolerances, the part tolerances, the value tolerances of resistors and capacitors on those big through hole things back then were plus or minus 5%. Mm. Oh, wow. So on a given day, we might assemble five of these and one of them sounds really good. <laughs> and the other four, uh, the other four, okay. You calibrate it, but right. I get mine. I don't know any better unless I put it, I find call those other four guys. Hey, come over. Let's put them all together and see who's got the best one. Interesting. So, Today, we're able to make them with plus or minus 0.1% components. There you go. Nice. The, the consistency across the units. Well, right now, we've, um, we've got four effects in circulation. They are the um, Microtron 3, okay. which is the Mutron 3 successor optical envelope filter. Yeah. Um, and 
Then the Octaviter came second, which would have been is our you know uh, analog octave down plus an octave up ring modulator. I'm gonna get one of those. I'm gonna get an original <laughs> one. <laughs> original ones are sick. We we sat there when we built this and ca- and calibrated it side by side with a, a fully refurbished 1980 ARP unit, and oh, uh, oh, they nice. were identical at all test points on the scope. So oh, you can get cool. a new one for a fraction of the price. Yeah. And you can take that on the road with you. Exactly. Yeah. And always get another one. So and these are small. It's cool. I have factors, an old one too, right? but it yeah. sits in a box yeah. next to my Octavia. These are um, the new ones. Yeah. Are, the new ones, it's fair to mention that, you know, I, I think one of the, the things that we love about the old ones is that they're big, funky boxes with big, funky graphics. But the new ones are all very compatible for, yeah. for modern pedal boards. Because looking at it, it yes. like what you kind of said, uh, Ren, is that, uh, I mean, just looking at the pictures here, they're kind of like small form factor and the hardware is probably more, uh, more sustainable now too, right? Um, along yeah. with the tolerances, the old ones are pretty big, and uh, they're that's, that's what he's saying. Yeah, well, like the the foot switches. Well, I mean, now well, with yeah. today's technology, is probably a little bit more uh, rugged. I guess I don't know if they they're they're sense. more quiet. I can tell you that yeah. the old ones, the the old push switches are, are it's, they're pretty loud when you press down on them. I've yeah. got. Yeah, there wasn't true bypass on that, you know, it was yeah. just, and, and a lot of guys actually liked that bleed that came out of the Mutron 3. So in the new Boostron, that's actually one of the preamp choices. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So, um, I think I might have that, to check that's that going to be, what, 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 what oh, we've yeah. kind of been doing is, is just going through, I've been going through a lot of the R and D schematics of all our products stuff that was in development and really trying to say what what would be useful and how can we translate that to work in in this format and what else would it really need to be better than what just was there we got to add a feature to make it do a little bit more do you guys have all the like do you guys have all the like archived R&D schematics and everything from like the 70s? I, all the artwork, yeah, I have oh, access so to pretty cool. much oh, pretty much all of that stuff. Cool. Well, look, if you look at the digital delay, which they made, they made one rack mount unit yeah. um, then, and that was like the last thing, and it, it's got to be like 15 pages of, of NASA Boy. schematics. I well, mean, you're, you're building your own AD converters back in 19... Yeah. yeah. Well, that's I like wouldn't do the, that one. I wouldn't do that today, you know, and that, that actually has a tape echo vibe to it, but yeah, uh, it's definitely a better way to build that. So is there something that, that aside from the ones that, that you've basically brought from the past to the future and the, new, and the, and the modern form factors that are more sustainable, more rugged, more uh, reliable. Is there something that, um, that that you were working on that is brand new or that hasn't ever been done by Mutron? Well, yeah, I mean that's uh, you know first of all a, a new a new trend in the in the uh, pedal board market is I see these uh, scalable power supplies and pedals I can put in from nine volts to eighteen volts into this pedal and. Mm-hmm. Yada, yada, yada. So uh, to make these things work, we basically devised, um, because we're here in San Diego, it's a pretty big, um, um, what would you call it, biomed, sort of biotech industry. Yeah. And you got Qualcomm down here. It was making all the chips for all the cell phones and pacemakers and stuff. So we, we've got this medical grade charge pump that's letting us run things internally at 18 volts. Um, and that's why we can have this thing have a 50 milliamp draw and sit on your pedal board um so that that's pretty huge um and that's across our whole platform the next thing that got um developed was basically to recreate um the phasers correctly both uh, the biphase is pretty much, I have it in prototype stage right now. We, we have a biphase released, but we have a biphase two that is now based upon our optical platform. So we've developed our own oh. optical um, socketed chip, if you will, uh, Intel inside. But it's, it's our actually Mu thing, which makes our har- analog hardware pedals upgradable. Oh, cool. Um, That's super cool. Yeah. So um, I... You know, Mike and I and and the other Mutron guys, as well as a lot of uh, other effects people have, you know, certain thoughts and knowledge about optical circuits and 
uh, Vactrols and things like that. Uh, well, I and I would say, Vactrol. yeah, I, t- I would say <laughs> that there was a lot of research that hadn't been done. Yeah. Because there was off the shelf things at the time available, but those companies don't exist anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, so for us to really decompose what those were, um, and, and an interesting thing was is back in the Mutron, the, the 1.0 days, the uh, Mutron biphases, they had a sort, you know, they had 12 of these in each unit. Um, they had to sort them and match them mm-hmm. because we're running these factuals outside of the specifications that the manufacturers got on there. Oh. So the ones that were left over that didn't match, that's what they built phaser twos out of without uh i'm i'm scared to ask this question because i don't know where it's going to lead and i don't know if there's a short answer to this but what exactly is a factorial um a factorial is is like a is what makes something optical you know you can make your own there's pre-packaged ones uh-huh. so and like it's basic it's a way of, of stuff like that it's, Optical. Anything yeah. you hear optical, it means okay. it's pretty much they got them inside of Arduinos and Whoa. things too for light sensors. So you, you know, basically, you're shooting an LED at a light sensor. Uh-huh. Yeah, pretty much at its okay. bare bones. What it is is a resistor that's light dependent. So the brighter it is, the you know, it changes resistance based on brightness. It, it varies resistance. So, but it, it eliminates noise because you're not actually right. passing current; you're passing light pulses. Gotcha. So gotcha. it becomes a less noisy circuit. And yeah, we all just learned something right now. I like this. Yay! Yay. Okay. All right. uh, yay. I, I can't wait Optical to test Optical compressors. Out. Yeah, I can't wait to test out this new biphase. I've got the uh, the uh, gigantic original one at home, and and I wanted to make a comment about that. I don't see how anybody else uses those without two different amplifiers that you you know because you could uh split the signal and you know have a left and a right and i i don't want to know what it sounds like through one amplifier because i i just i love this the stereo phase effect some uh, some guys jam. love to cast some guys love to cascade them mono too you know i mean mm-hmm. um but you said left and right and i actually think the answer is top and bottom i think you're so, right too. There was a biphase nice. uh, deluxe that never saw the light of day, and it actually had presets on it. So the idea is, is I set my left phase or my bottom phase at a um, basically the foundation speed would be let's say five, mm. and my top rotor I would set at seven. So now I have the motion of a of a Leslie where they have two different speeds going. Yeah, wild um, oh, man. So they had a break on it. I could speed them up together. Um, and that's why I love phasers, because I actually used to carry a Fender Leslie cabinet when I would play in bands. <laughs> Holy oh, mackerel. Don't need one now. So, oh, no. the thing I still have it. I right, love the right. things. But, but the idea was that if I'm going to make a phaser, I'm going to take this idea. So the, the phaser three, I, we made it so that you can cascade the control voltage. So I could run to one unit and then to the next with one expression pedal. And where I have the rate set on the faceplate is basically the, the floor of my speed. Um, so then I just sp- run my signal to two different amps, and it's a poor man's biphase. Yep. But with foot control, it, it really acts like a Leslie speaker. If you're playing, um, like you listen to Charlie Hunter Tree or any of these, like, sort of think like a jazz organist. Right. And and add one more question about the new biface coming out. Are you guys gonna have the little, um, the little templates that you put over the pedal? It's a <laughs> it's the size of a hand. I know, but you can still make one, right? Uh, for who? Like we, I've, I've got the old templates that go oh over the old God. biface. So hold on to those. Oh those yeah, those are cool. Yeah, you know, we talked about them. I have, I actually have temp. I we printed them. We planned on it, but um. I I think maybe so. I think we have them in PDF format, so if people yeah. can figure out how to print them and cut holes. And you should make T-shirts out of those, man. <laughs> That's, That's a good real. idea. For real. I'm Actually, not yeah. Well, and just let people write their settings on them too, right? <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool as heck. Uh, man, Rand, we are super, super stoked that you got to hang out and talk Mutron pedals with us. Um, this has been one that we've gotten so many requests for, and you have a beloved company and uh, I hope you just continue to 
motorcycle no, that, outside. That, that chopper, that chopper, <laughs> that chopper that agrees. Wasn't me, was it? <laughs> Is that me? Wow. No, no there was, it was here. The big old yeah. motorcycle. They they were agreeing with us. Uh, Anyways, um, hey, we got to. We're gonna we're gonna tail our way out of here, we, but we've got a couple things that we got to get to first. Number one is Jared's favorite thing in the whole wide world. Which is, ladies and gentlemen, would you rather... Thank you, Tony. All right. All right. So, this week's Would You Rather is from a good friend of ours, Jonathan Jurisic. That's right. Big Jonathan out there. JJ! And (laughs) here's this... Okay, would you rather show up to a gig and play an amp that you've never played but have your number one guitar... Mm. So a strange amp, but you have your number one guitar, right? Mm. Or would you rather show up to a gig with your number one amp Mm. and use a guitar that you've never played before? So you're going to use some sort of strange guitar. Yeah. That's it. Is there a Mutron involved? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it could be. Let, let's let's focus on the on the actual question. Um, all right, so let's make sure everybody has this clear. You show up to a gig. It's your amp and a strange guitar, or your guitar and a strange amp. What would you rather do, Tony? Uh, my guitar and a strange amp. Okay, because I usually play strange amps yeah, that's, anyhow. That's true. There's nothing <laughs> but no, I, I, you know, yeah. the guitar. I mean, is is like half the battle. That is more than half the battle. Nothing like strange, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mike, how about yourself? I'd probably go with uh, my favorite amp, and then just some random guitar. I've showed up to too many places, and they've had some trashy amp there that it's hard to dial in. At least if I dial, like it had the, like uh, a bad childhood, and like went made a few uh, directions. Or, yeah, okay. and uh, lived in a trailer park. <laughs> <laughs> it just got back from recovery, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I'd probably just go with my own amp, and then yeah, I'll just bump somebody's guitar. Uh-huh. Um, this yeah. is hilarious because no one has ever seen Mike not play his only guitar. So, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> I had a terrible experience when I was like 17. I had my mid 70s Gibson SG standard like destroyed at a gig. Something fell over it because I was dumb and didn't put it in the case. Mm. So I got stuck with a strange guitar and it was through my amp. But that strange guitar was 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 a single coil guitar and it sounded nothing like mine. Mm. So because of that experience, I'm definitely going with my own guitar and a strange amp. Okay. Because it's gonna it's gonna sound better. Rand, how about yourself? I'll go with my guitar and whatever. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Backline pickups. amp. Your guitar. B bend B bender is pretty important, so Oh, hey, mm. there we go. That's pretty specific. Yeah. I'm yeah. definitely gonna go with my own guitar because you know why? Because it's glittery and gold. And, well, that, but <laughs> the other reason is because I would probably get stuck with a strat. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, let's go. A Mexican strat. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's, uh, we're going to thank a few people real quick. Yes, I would like to, at this point in our show, thank our executive producers. And you might be sitting there saying, what? the heck is an executive producer mm. well if you go over to patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs you can find out at different levels that you can uh, become a patron of the podcast the very top of the heap if yes. you will would be our executive producers and they get there's different prize packages that are attached to it keeps getting bigger because all it's these cool bigger and bigger this great and we got this yeah this champion lecky stuff that just came in you gotta yeah. get some of that but as an executive producer jared what happens you get to have your name right on the thing and that's what i'm gonna do right correct the mundo do so it. let's it. welcome uh, we'll go from newest uh, to oldest why not? Why not? Let's do Let's it. welcome on board Mr. John Esterly. John Esterly. Hey, Johnny. Hey, what I like about John Esterly, his name when it rhymes with Westerly, which was the birth, well, not the birthplace of Guild Guitars, but the, well, I guess it was this, the death place of Guild okay. Guitars. Yay! <laughs> hey, death place. Hey. Okay, how about uh, let's welcome or thank uh, Mr. Christopher Heidel. Yes, right. Hey. That's right. How about Ty Harmon? Yep. How about Taylor Bray? Okay. Ooh. John Anglin. Mm. Anthony Lanthrop. Anthony. Hey. My man. How about Johnny No? Johnny. Stefan Lamb. Rick Langlou. Langlou. Oh, Michael McVeigh. Michael Senchuk. Brian Robison. Jonathan Jerusik. 
Ken Sayers, Corey Nigro, Brad Partridge, Michael Van Zant, Doug Christ, Darren Gregory, Chris Kearney, Sean S. S. John Daly, Martin Cliff, and the original Tom, Tom Barazin. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for helping out our show. We are so grateful. It truly helps keep our lights on. Um, this is a this is a, a love thing for us. I don't know. I don't know how to say that <laughs> properly. So it's, it's never going to sound right. But we do this because we love it. Yes, we absolutely love it. We love the guitar world and we love the people that are making it. Thank you for your support. Um, you can enter in at, uh, at the five. If you can't, uh, if you can't swing the, do uh, what the you ten, can, do what, you, do what, do what can. you can do what makes you feel good. Yes. Yes. That's right. Um, so Rand, where can people find you? Mew-tron.com. <laughs> awesome online hey i really appreciate you guys at the guitar knobs uh and uh your fan base so we're gonna give out a uh, mutron uh guitar knobs code it's guitar knobs and that's gonna be a 10 percent discount and uh we really appreciate you guys having us on the show dude that is oh, that's awesome. fantastic thank you so much 10 percent off at mutron the website to get those um and uh how long is that gonna be for i don't know i'll, I'll leave it up for a while after the broadcast well, and, well uh, uh, yeah we'll sort that out we'll put that up on on instagram for those of you uh, who are uh looking to find this at the top of our instagram where you see our little story deals the little orange circles we have a, one of those that says offers so we've got a couple offers that are still on for the whole rest of of 2019 um and those are going to be those are still available all you got to do is click it and that's where you can find all these things and that's where we will have the Mutron special. Uh, let's see here. Mike? Yeah, just follow me on Instagram at Native Audio. Perfect. J Tony? Tony? Jared? Tony? Yeah. Uh, let's uh, just go over to PickGuardian.com. Let's say you need a special PickGuard or you uh -huh. want to change out pickups, different things like that. Head on over to the website Screen and you want to see some of these uh, very special projects that we've been discussing here. I usually post pictures up on Instagram. So go ahead and uh, go to Pick Guardian and the number one and you will find said projects. Awesome. Jared. Well, if anybody needs an old pickup fixed or some old new looking pickups or new old looking pickups, <laughs> whatever. If you want pickups that Let's sound awesome. Let's just say awesome. you want pickups. Awesome if you need pickups, pickups, go to Jared at BrandonWantPickups.com. That's my email. Go to BrandonWantPickups. There right. you go. Brandon Want Pickups. You can get a hold of me, Todd, at TheGuitarKnobs.com, or you can DM me on Instagram. We want to hear your would you rathers, so continue to send those in. And ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big, giant thank you to Rand Anderson of Mutron for stopping by and hanging out with us. Yay. That was a pleasure. I love it. Yeah, so much. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Brad. Yes. Hey, thanks, guys. Yeah, it was awesome. He's off to a gig, so we're going to let him go. Everybody have a great guitar week, and subscribe! Yeah. Yeah. All right. Tony. All right. All right. Do you have a hamster in there? <laughs> what is that? Yeah, Tony. Would you Tony. Which is? Are you talking to me, Tony? <laughs> Do I have a what? Well, that's it for these knobs. Please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs. Visit our website at theguitarknobs.com for all of our past episodes, four on the floor blog, and other good stuff. You can connect with us on social too at our Facebook page and share your gear and stories on our Facebook group. Also, be sure to check out our Instagram, at Guitar Knobs. Catch you next time.